Hello, sweet peas and sugar dumplings. It's your gay auntie, Shine and Nathan. Now, I'm so sorry I hadn't posted here in a hot minute. Life just got away from me, and I got so buried under social media stuff and work, work being the biggest part, that this kind of lagged behind. But now that I have more people uh, going on to my Patreon and being my patrons and making sure I don't have to be beholden to advertisers, I'm able to start taking more time to shift things a little bit more here. And I do ask any of y'all that subscribe here, I have a $3 level on my Patreon. And if I were to get even a 1% of my TikTok following or one-fifth of 0.5%, I would be able to do this full time because I really do enjoy making y'all laugh and smile. But anyway, if you want to become a patron on my Patreon, there's a link over there on in on the YouTube channel or be in the link below in the description below. But I also have a big announcement. Now, I know many people miss my Serial Killer Southern Bell series that I used to do on TikTok. Now, I stopped doing that because of the community guidelines violations. I've been bereaved about causing any mischief with them. But I've decided to bring it here. I did the little trailer for it. Just a little one mixed of all the videos I did before. Well, now I'm going to start recording new content based off of that little fantastic story we created in TikTok. And that's going to be a one-man show type of deal until later on I can start having people maybe join me in it. But I'll be recording it from my phone, and I think I can do it. And I'm excited to take on the challenge. But anyway, I know you want to know uh, what it is I'm reading today. I'm not sure if I mentioned it yet. I do go on little tangents. I'm continuing on chapter five of Sherlock Holmes and the Hound of Baskerville. This time, though, I'm going to try things a little different. You can let me know in the comments if you liked it or not. I'm going to add some commentary while I read. Some people requested that over on my Patreon, and I've had some people request it when I've done live story times that they really found it delightful. So I'm going to try it here for the entire chapter, and y'all let me know what you think. Now, without further ado, I'm going to get into The Hound of Baskerville by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Chapter 5, Three Broken Threads. Sherlock Holmes had, in a very remarkable degree, the power of detaching his mind at will. For two hours, the strange business in which he had been involved appeared to be forgotten, and he was entirely absorbed in the pictures of the modern Bulgarian masters. He would talk of nothing but art, of which he had the crudest ideas, from our leaving the gallery until we found ourselves at the Northumberland Hotel. Sir Henry Baskerville is upstairs expecting you, said the clerk. He asked me to show you up at once when you came. Have you any objection to my looking at your register, said Holmes. Not in the least. The book showed that two names had been added after that of Baskerville. One was a Timphilius Johnson and family of Newcastle, the other Mrs. Oldmore and Maid of High Lodge Alton. Surely that must be the same Johnson whom I used to know, said Holmes to the porter. A lawyer, is he not, grey-headed and walks with the limp? Uh, no, sir, this is Mr. Johnson, the coal owner. A very active gentleman, no older than yourself. Surely you are mistaken about his trade. No, sir. He has used this hotel for many years, and he is very well known to us. Ah, that settles it. Mrs. Oldmore, too, I seem to remember the name. Excuse my curiosity, but often in calling upon one friend, one finds another. She is an invalid lady, sir. Her husband was once mayor of Gloucester. She always comes to us when she is in town. These Victorians are very chatty. You know, they're people after my own heart when you want a little bit of gossip, but dang, you don't even know these people. Imagine if you tried to do that now here in like San Antonio, Houston, or like New York. The disrespect. Thank you. I'm afraid I cannot claim her acquaintance. We have established a most important fact by these questions, Watson. He continued in a low voice as we went upstairs together. 
We now know that the people who are so interested in our friend have not settled down in his own hotel. That means that while they are, as we have seen, very anxious to watch him, they are not equally anxious that he should not see them. Now, this is the most suggestive fact. Well, what is suggestive? It suggests... Hello, my dear fellow, what on earth is the matter? As we came round the top of the stairs, we had run up against Sir Henry Baskerville himself. His face was flushed with anger, and he held an old and dusty boot in one of his hands. So furious was he that he was hardly articulate, and when he did speak, it was a much broader and more western dialect than any which we had heard from him in the morning. It seems to me that we they are playing me for a sucker in this hotel, he cried. They'll find they've started in to monkey with the wrong man unless they are careful. By thunder, if that chap can't find my missing boot, there will be trouble. I can take a joke with the best, Mr. Holmes, but they've got a bit more of the mark this time. Still looking for your boot? Yes, sir, and I mean to find it. But surely you said that it was a new brown no, it is, sir, and now it's an old black one. Wh what? What do you mean to say? That's just what do I mean to say. I only had three pairs in the world, the new brown, the old black, and the patent leathers, which I am wearing. Last night they took one of my brown ones, and today they have sneaked one of the black. Well, what have you got? Speak out, man, and don't start staring. An agitated German waiter had appeared upon the scene. Uh, no, sir, I have made inquiry all over the hotel, but I cannot hear no word of it. Well, either the boot comes back before sundown, or I'll see the manager, and tell them that I go straight out of this hotel. It shall be found, sir. I promise you that if it will be in, have a little patience, it will be found. Mind it is, for it's the last thing of mine that I will lose in this den of thieves. <clears throat> well, well, Mr. Holmes, you'll excuse my troubling about such a trifle. Well, I think it well worth troubling about. Why, wow, you look very serious over it. How do you explain it? I just don't attempt to explain it. It seems the very maddest, queerest thing that ever happened to me. The queerest, perhaps, said Holmes thoughtfully. What do you make of it yourself? <clears throat> I misspoke. That was supposed to be the voice of Sir Henry. What do you make of it yourself? Well, I don't pretend to understand it yet. This case of yours is very complex, Sir Henry. When taken in conjunction with your uncle's death, I'm not sure that... Of all the 500 cases of capital importance which I have handled, there is one which cuts so deep. But we hold several threads in our hands, and the odds are that one or the other of them guides us to the truth. We may waste time in following the wrong one, but sooner or later we'll come upon the right. We had a pleasant luncheon in which little was said of business which had brought us together. It was in a private sitting room to which we afterwards repaired that Holmes asked Baskerville what were his intentions. Well, to go to Baskerville Hall. And when? At the end of the week. Well, on the whole, said Holmes, I think that your decision is a wise one. I have ample evidence that you are being dogged in London, and amid the millions of this great city it is difficult to discover who these people are or what their objective is. If their intentions are evil, then might do you a mischief, and we should powerless to prevent it. You do not know, Dr. Mortimer, that you were followed this morning from our house? Dr. Mortimer startled violently. Followed? Oh, by whom? That, unfortunately, is what I cannot tell you. Have you among your neighbors' acquaintance in Dartmoor any man with a black, full beard? Oh, no, or let me see. Why, yes. Barrymore, Sir Charles's butler, is a man with a full black beard. Ha! Huh. Where is Barrymore? Well, he's in charge of the hall. We'd best ascertain if he is really there, or if by any possibility he might be in London. And how can you do that? 
<clears throat> well, give me a telegraph form. It's all ready for Sir Henry. That would do. Address to Mr. Barrymore, Baskerville Hall. What is the nearest telegraph? Grimpen. Very good. I, we will send it a second wire to the postmaster. Grimpen. Telegram to Barrymore to be delivered into his own hand. If absent, please return wire to Sir Henry Baskerville, Northumberland Hotel. Now, that should let us know before evening whether Barrymore's at his post in Devonshire or not. This is really hard, pain in the butt to add, to read sometimes, because you don't know when it's switching between persons, because they had a different way of writing back then. Pain in the butt to know who's, whose voice goes where. Well. So I'm going to mess up, but it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> That's so, all, said Baskerville. By the way, Mr. M Dr. Mortimer, who is this Barrymore anyway? He is the son of the old caretaker, who is dead. No, she. They have looked after the hall for four generations now. So far as I know, he and his wife are respectable, a couple as of any in the county. At the same time said Baskerville. It's clear enough that so long as there is no family at the hall, these people have a mighty fine home and nothing to do. Well, that is true. Did Barrymore profit at all from Sir Henry Charles's will? There we go. Did Barrymore profit at all by Sir Charles's will? Asked Holmes. Well, he and his wife have 500 pounds each. Huh. Did they know that they would receive this? Well, yes. Sir Charles was very fond of talking about the provisions of his will. Hmm. That is very interesting. Well, I hope, said Dr. Mortimer, that you do not look with suspicious eyes upon everyone who received a legacy from Sir Charles, for I also had a thousand pounds left to me. Indeed. And anyone else? Well, there were many insignificant sums to individuals and a large number of public charities, the residue all went to Sir Henry. And how much was the residue? 740,000 pounds. Holmes raised his eyebrows in surprise. I had no idea that such a gigantic t sum was involved, said he. Sir Charles had the re reputation of being rich, but we did not know how very rich he was until he came to examine his insecurities. The total value of the state was close to one million. Dear me, it is a stake for which a man might well play a desperate game. And one more question, Dr. Mortimer. Supposing that anything happened to our young friend here, you'll forgive the unpleasant hypothesis. Who would not inherit the, in the estate? Um, since Sir Roger Baskerville, Sir Charles' younger brother, died unmarried, the estate would descend to the Desmonds, who are distant cousins. James Desmond is an elderly clergyman in Westmoreland. Thank you. These are details are all of great interest. Have you met Mr. James Desmond? Okay, with that. Yes, he once came down to visit Sir Charles. He is a man of vulnerable appearance and of saintly life. I remember that he refused to accept any settlement from Sir Charles, though he pressed it upon him. And this man of simple taste would be the heir to Sir Charles's thousands? He would be the heir to the estate, because that is entitled. He would also be the heir to the money, unless it were willed otherwise by the present owner, who can, of course, do what he likes with it. And have you made your will, Sir Henry? Oh, no, sir. <clears throat> no, Mr. Holmes, I have not. I've had no time, for it was only yesterday that I learned how matters stood. But in any case, I feel that the money should go with the title and estate. That was my poor uncle's idea. How How is the owner going to restore the glories of the Baskervilles if he has no money enough to keep up the property? House, land, and dollars must go together. Quite so. Well, Sir Henry, I am of one mind with you as to the advisability of your going down to Devonshire without delay. There's only one provision which I must make. You certainly... 
must not go alone. Well, Dr. Mortimer returns with me, but Dr. Mortimer has his practice to attend to, and his house is miles away from yours. With all the goodwill in the world, he may be unable to help you. No, Sir Henry, you must take with you someone, a trustworthy man, one who will always be by your side. Oh, well, is it possible that you come yourself, Mr. Holmes? If matters come to a crisis, I should endeavor to be present in person, but you can understand that with my extensive consulting practice and with the constant appeals which reach me from many quarters, it is impossible to be absent from London for an indefinite time. At the present instant, one of my most revered names in England is being besmirched by a blackmailer, and only I can stop a disastrous scandal. You will see how impossible it is for me to go to Dartmoor. Whom would you recommend, then? Holmes laid his hand upon my arm. If my friend would undertake it, there is no man who is better worth having at your side when you are in a tight place. No one can say more so confidently than I. The proposition took me by complete surprise, but before I had time to answer, Baskerville seized me by the hand and rugged it heartily. Well, now that is real kind of you, Dr. Watson, said he. You will see it is how it is with me, and you just know just as much about the matter as I do. If you'll come down to Beckersville Hall and see me through, I'll never forget it. The promise of adventure had always a fascination for me. And I was complimented by the words of Holmes and by the eagerness with which the baronet hailed me as a companion. I will come with pleasure, said I. I do not know how I could employ my time better. And you will report very carefully to me, said Holmes. When a crisis comes, as it will do, I will direct you how you shall act. I suppose that by Saturday I might be ready. Would that suit you, Dr. Watson? Oh, perfectly. Then on Saturday, unless you hear to the Gondry, we shall meet at 10.30 train from Paddington. We had risen to depart when Baskerville gave a cry of triumph, and diving into one of the corners of the room, he drew a brown boot from under a cabinet. My missing boot! May all of our difficulties vanish as easily, said Sherlock Holmes. But it's a very singular thing, Dr. Mortimer remarked. I searched this room carefully before lunch. And so did I, said Baskerville. Every inch of it. There was certainly no boot in it then. In that case, the waiter must have placed it there while we were lunching. The German was sent for, but professed to know nothing of the matter, nor could any inquiry clear it up. Another item had added to the constant and apparently purposeless series of small mysteries which had succeeded each other so rapidly. Setting aside the whole grim story of Sir Charles' death, we had a line of inexplicable incidents all within the limits of two days, which included the receipt of the printed paint letter, the black bearded spy and the handsome, the loss of the new brown boot, the loss of the old black boot, and the now the return of the new brown boot. Holmes had in silence in the cab, sat in silence in the cab as we drove back to back Baker Street, and I knew from his drawn brows and keen face that his mind, like my own, was busy endeavoring to frame some scheme into which all these strange and apparently disconnected episodes could be fitted. All afternoon and late into the evening, he sat lost in tobacco and thought. Just before dinner, two telegrams were handed in. The first ran. Have just heard from ba Baron Moore at the hall. Baskerville, the second. Visited 33 hotels as directed, but saw a report unable to trace cut sheet of times. Cartwright. Well, there go two of my threads, Watson. There is nothing more stimulating the case when everything goes against you. We must cast around for another scent. I add that. We still have the cabman who drove the spy. Exactly, and I have wired to get his name and address from the official registry, and I should not be surprised if there was an answer to my question. 
The ring at the bell proved to be something even more satisfactory than an answer. However, for the door opened and a rough-looking fellow entered, who was evidently the man himself, i.e. the cab driver. Things happen so quick for Victorian London without having internet. You know, one of the fun facts about Victorian London is that they had couriers, like mailmen, that would go all hours of the day, currying letters back and forth all across London. That was a fun little fact. Little little interesting history textbook, the tidbit. I think that was before we had telegrams. Anyway. I got a message from the head office that a gent at this address had even inquired for number 2704, said he. I've driven my cab this seven years and never a word of complaint. I came here straight from the yard to ask you to your face what you had against me. Well, I have nothing in the world against you, my good man, said Holmes. On the contrary, I have half a sovereign for if you'll give me a clear answer to my question. Well, I've had a good day and no mistake, said the cabman with a grin. What was it you wanted to ask, sir? First of all, your name and address in case I want you again. John Clayton, 3 Turpis Street, the borough. My cab is out of Shipley's Yard near Waterloo Station. Sherlock Holmes made out of it. Now, Clayton, tell me all about the fair who came and watched this house at 10 o'clock this morning and afterward followed the two gentlemen down Regent Street. The man looked surprised and a little embarrassed. Why, there's no good my telling you things, for you seem to know as much as I do already, said he. The truth is, the gentleman told me that he was a detective and that I was to say nothing about him to anyone. My good fella, this is a very serious business, and you may find yourself in a pretty bad situation if you try to hide anything from me. You say that your fed told you that he was a detective? Yep, he did. Would he say this? When he left me, did he say anything more? He mentioned his name. Holmes cast a swift glance of triumph at me. Oh, he mentioned his name, did he? That was imprudent. What was the name that he mentioned? His name, said the cabman, was Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Never had I seen my friend more completely taken aback than by that cabman's reply. For an instant, he sat in silent amazement. Then he burst into a hearty laugh. <laughs> a touch, Watson, an undeniable touch, said he. I feel a fall as quick and supple as my own. He got home upon me very prettily at that time. So his name was Sherlock Holmes, was it? Yes, sir, that was the gentleman's name. Excellent. Tell me where you picked him up and all that occurred. Well, he hailed me at half past nine in Trafalgar Square. He said that he was a detective, and he offered me two guineas if I would do exactly what he wanted all day and ask no questions. I was glad enough to agree. First, we drove down to Northumberland Hotel and waited there until two gentlemen came out and took a cab from the rank. We followed their cab until it pulled up somewhere near here. This very door, said Holmes. Well, I couldn't be sure of that, but I dare say my fed knew well about it. We pulled up halfway down the street and waited an hour and a half. Then the two gentlemen passed us walking, and we followed down Baker Street and along. I know said Holmes. Until we got three quarters down Regent Street. Then my gentleman threw up the trap and he cried that I should drive out of way to Waterloo Station as hard as I could go. I whipped up the mare and we were there under ten minutes. Then he paid up his two guineas like a good one and away he went into the station. Only just as he was leaving he turned around and said, it might interest you to know that you have been driving Mr. Sherlock Holmes. That's how I come to know his night. I see. And you saw no more of him? Not after he went in the station. And how would you describe Mr. Sherlock Holmes? The cabman scratched his head. Well, he wasn't altogether such an easy gentleman to describe. I put him at 40 years of age and he was of middle height. Two or three inches shorter than you, sir. 
He was dressed like a toff, and he had a black beard, cut square at the end, and a pale face. I don't know as I could say more than that. Color of his eyes? No, I couldn't say that. Nothing more that you remember? No, sir, nothing. Well then, here's your half a sovereign. There's another one waiting for you if you can bring any more information. Good night. Well, good night. Thank you, sir. John Clayton departed chuckling, and Holmes turned to me with a shrug of his shoulders and a rueful smile. Snap goes our third thread, and we end up where we began, said he. Oh, the cunning rascal. He knew our number, knew that Sir Bas Henry Baskerville had consulted me, spotted who I was in Regent Street, conjectured that I'd got the number of the cab and would lay my hands on the driver, and so sent back his audacious message. I tell you, Watson, this time we've got a foeman who is worthy of our steam. I've been checkmated in London. Hmm. I could only wish you better luck in Devonshire, but I'm not easy in my mind about it. About what? About sending you. It's an ugly business, Watson, and an ugly, dangerous business. The more I see of it, the less I like. Yes, my dear fellow, you may laugh, but I give you my word that I shall be very glad to have you back safe and sound at Baker Street once more. And that concludes Chapter 5 of The Hound of Baskerville by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a Sherlock Holmes story. If you like this, please give me a subscribe, a like, and heck that notification bell. And you're welcome to follow me on my other social media platforms, like Instagram. I've been getting very busy on there. You more than likely follow me from TikTok, so I'm very glad you're here. And if you want more exclusive content, feel free to go on over to my Patreon. Just search Patreon, type in Shine and Nathan two words. Anyway. I look forward to reading more for y'all, and y'all have a really good day, and I can't wait to start getting on to The Bell, uh, my little web series that has to do with my serial killer persona from TikTok. Anyway, sweet peas, I love Now, you. without my patrons on Patreon, I couldn't make this all possible and grow and build, and these are my sweet darling patrons who are at my highest tier level of $20 a month. And here's Layla Shipman, Emmanuel Cervantes, Vanessa Horn, Jacqueline, Anne-Marie Flood, Jennifer Mason, Madeline Wilkerson, Paula Malcolm, Einhart, Morgan Martinez, Lisa, Alicia Mitchell, Mariah Carmen, Angie Walmart Wolf 13, Michelle Morningstar, Jackie Robert, Midget Kajit, Rachel Gassidy, Vivian Morg, Durja Durja, Lisa Matter, Rachel Cade, Chris Trevenia, Luna Mortimer, Space Kitty 87, Danielle Heyman, Erica Warren, Ivana Jade, Hope, Anna Dillon, Megan Kohulik, Beth Lay Fox, Ellie Mitchell, Jennifer Bull, Ray, Brian Dixon, Bethany Eddings, Helena Hinkle, Angela, Heather Leach, and Carolyn B. As always, you're more than welcome to become one of my wonderful patrons. These are just my sweet darlings at my highest tier level. I have a tier as low as $3. Now, please stay tuned for the next episode of Storytime with Shine and Nathan and the upcoming series, The Bell. I know, I'm just a little excited to announce it. Thank you all, my sweeties, and I hope y'all stay safe, drink some water, and take care of yourselves now, baby dolls.